Uh, we have a rolling machine here, high-tech uh, Chevalier grinding machine. Apart from that, the technicians here are really very cooperative. We can access 24-7 uh, facilities. Here you can see uh, behind me, this is a, uh, a one of its kind rolling machine in India that is uh, nowhere available in the other institute. Uh, this is the central workshop which we are seeing. This is mainly uh, used for uh, enhancing, serving and supporting the academic skills of uh, B.Tech, M.Tech, M.S. and Ph.D. students. Students are uh, likely to benefit from an international exposure in this day and age when, uh, when globalization of business is, is the name of the game. I got the chance to travel to so many different European countries and cities. I got to experience history, art, culture, you know, hands on. There were students from all over the world, from countries like Malaysia, Indonesia, Taiwan, uh, even Uzbekistan, Spain and so on. So obviously the multicultural experience in such a program was very different from what you get in exchange program. The program was funded by JASO Scholarship Program which is a uh, funded program by the Japan government for Indian students. Important thing for me was the fact that I got to live by myself and I got to cook for myself and I got to take care of myself while I was there and it gave me a sense of uh, adulthood and uh, growing up. There were students from all over the world in uh, Politecnico and uh, I met around students from every nationality and uh, I, I learned a lot from them too about their experiences, about their culture, their language. Besides the academic program, the institute also took us to various industrial trips that were very beneficial. As engineers, we got to experience a lot. We got a huge exposure there. We got to know what all new technologies are coming up and how to implement them. In all, I think I ended up making friends from 25 different countries. So if you're a person who loves to make friends, who loves to be international, who loves to be global, I think this is, this is the thing for you. The landmark of IIT Madras, held very dear by generations of students who have studied here. What do these statues represent? The Gajendra literal meaning is the Lord of the Deities, Lord of the Elephants, is ruling over the heaven. When we came to IIT Madras and saw that we are on Gajendra circle, we felt that we are on the top of everything. So we thought it would be very cool to have a picture on the elephant of Gajendra circle. The Gajendra circle didn't always look like this. It has constantly evolved. What we see now is the fourth installment of GC. Place where we all celebrate our birthdays and we see most colourful during all the fests. Ganyan Circle has been used as a mascot for uh, inter-IT sports. It is an integral part of IIT Madras. Whatever it may signify, this majestic installation is sure to go unmissed by just about anyone who enters the gates of this institution. Hello and welcome to the 11th Iris webinar. Success is. Hello and welcome to the 11th Iris webinar, Deployable AI under the cluster AI and Data Science. I am Ujwala Koti, Lead Program Administrator at the Office of Global Engagement, IIT Madras. Our speaker today is Dr. Arun Rajkumar. Dr. Arun Rajkumar is currently an Assistant Professor at the Computer Science and Engineering Department of IIT Madras. Prior to joining IIT Madras, he was a research scientist at the Xerox Research Center, Bangalore, for three years. He earned his PhD from the Indian Institute of Science, where he worked on ranking from pairwise comparison. His areas of research include machine learning, statistical learning theory, and sequential decision making. Our moderator today is Professor Sriram Natarajan. 
Professor Sriram is a professor in the computer science and the director of the Center of Machine Learning at the University of Texas at Dallas. His research interests lie in the fields of artificial intelligence and machine learning and their application to healthcare problems. More specifically, he is interested in the areas of relational learning, reinforcement learning, graphical models, and planning. Till 2017, he was a faculty member at Indiana University, and previously, he was an assistant professor at Wake Forest School of Medicine. He was a postdoc earlier at the Department of Computer Science in the University of Wisconsin, Madison, working with Professor Jude Shavlik and David Page. Specifically, he is interested in the areas of relation learning, reinforcement learning, um, graphic models, and planning. Also joining us today as panelists are Professor Balram Ravindran, Professor at the Department of Computer Science and Engineering and Head RBC Desai at IIT Madras. We also have Professor Raghunathan Rangaswamy, Professor, Department of Chemical Engineering at IIT Madras. Dr. Karthik Raman, Associate Professor, Department of Biotechnology at IIT Madras. And Dr. Geeta Krishnan Ramadurai, Associate Professor, Department of Civil Engineering at the IIT Madras. Dr. Arun, I welcome and over to you. Uh, can you see my screen and hear me well? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Uh, thanks uh, for the introduction. Uh, it gives me uh, immense pleasure to introduce the Center of Excellence in Deployable Artificial Intelligence, an IITM initiative here today. Uh, and I would like to start by thanking uh, Professor Sriram for kindly accepting our uh, invite to be the moderator of this session. Okay, let's get started. Uh, so what is deployable artificial intelligence? So any story about uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence um, is going to begin with data, the hero of the story. And a typical story in machine learning goes like this, right? So you have a bunch of data and then you apply an algorithm, the sophisticated algorithm on this data and out comes a model. And you see that the model, the accuracy of the model um, performs very well. It, it performs with very high accuracy and you think it's a happy story and what you do then is you take this model and then apply it to the real world, right? But unfortunately, it, the translation from applying laboratory successes to real world is not direct and often has a lot of uh, hidden things, right? So this translation may lead to failures in the model. When I say failure, it not necessarily means that failure in the accuracy that you saw in the uh, laboratory experiments, but these failures could come from several different sources. And uh, these are the challenges uh, that one must be aware of when one is trying to deploy a machine learning algorithm in the real world. And that is what our center focuses on, right? So I'm gonna give a couple of examples of what these type of failures might be and what are the uh, you know, problems involving deployable artificial intelligence. So let's start with a simple example. And I'm sure a lot of you might have seen this news recently where uh, when you search for the ugliest language in India, um, and Google would throw up the answer as Canada, right? And this news uh, created a lot of backlash and uh, Google eventually apologized for, uh, for this. And when asked what is the reason for Google to give Canada as the answer, they came up with this answer, right? So and I quote, sometimes the way content is described on the internet can yield surprising results to specific queries. What does this mean? This means that there are some implicit biases in the data which Google was using to make this prediction as Canada for this question, ugliest language in India. And the algorithm did not know that such a bias existed in data and it was oblivious to that. And hence, such a result came about, right? So what I want to point out here is that there might be implicit biases in data. Now, one might ask that, well, this is fine, but then this, this example does not really affect the lives of anybody. So why should one care about biases in data? Now here is another example. This was uh, based on a system called Compass, uh, which was used to predict in, in US uh, whether uh, 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 somebody who was arrested for a crime, if he's let out of prison, what is the uh, possibility that he, would, he or she would recommit a crime, right? So it was doing what is called as recidivism prediction. And uh, the system would actually give a risk score based on the profile of the uh, 
of, of the person who has committed a crime, right? So in this example, there were two people, one on the left and the right, and the system gave a low risk to the one on the left and high risk to the one on the right, a risk for recommitting a crime if these people were let out of the prison, right? And what really happened after these two people were actually let out of the prison was that the one on the left who was given a low risk score by the uh, system actually went ahead and subsequently committed a grand theft, whereas the one on the right did no other offense, right? And if you looked at the prior offenses of these people, the one on the left had two armed robberies, whereas the one on the right had four juvenile misdemeanors. Now, what is happening, right? So it, it clearly seems so that the system has gone wrong here, but why did it do this? Well, what has happened is that the, the data on which the system is trained to make these risk score predictions was actually biased towards one particular subpopulation, in this case, the, uh, the Blacks, right? So in fact, if you actually looked at and a careful look at the data actually reveal some interesting patterns, right? Um, those people who were labeled as high risk by the system, but then when they were left out, let out of the prison, if the fraction of people who never committed a crime after that, but they did not reoffend, if you looked at the percentage, the ones who were labeled high risk, uh, the ones who did not reoffend were 45% of them were actually African Americans, whereas only 23% of them were white people. On the other hand, those who were labeled as lower risk, but then when they were let out, they did reoffend, where 47% of them were whites, whereas 28% were African Americans. Right? So clearly, uh, what the algorithm was doing was completely not reflecting what really happened later in, in the real world. Right. So now, if a judge actually uses this risk score while producing a sentence for this person, then it clearly um, is not is incorrect. And, and, and that's the reason why the system was taken off the uh, US system today. Um, and simply because the system was trained on previous data and previous racial biases of judges uh, were getting reflected in the algorithms out. Right? So, and this is, this is a bigger problem now because somebody's amount of years in a prison would could actually depend on an algorithm's output, right? So uh, of course, maybe we are not committing crimes, and now is it something that is going to affect me and you um, uh, on a daily basis if you ask something like that? Then yes, it could, right? So for instance, there was this 2014 or 15 uh, tool uh, that Amazon tried to develop to uh, help uh, it recruit people, right? And this tool was known to have biases against a particular gender, in this case, women. What does that mean? That means that if you took two people who applied to Amazon with exactly similar profiles, just that one was a male and the other was a female, the system would actually prefer the male to be recruited than the female, right? Of course, Amazon scrapped the system, but then if you looked at again why this happened, the system was trained on Amazon's previous recruitment data and most of Amazon's previous recruit or significant population were actually men as, a, as against women. And there was an implicit bias, which was getting seen uh, in the uh, algorithm's prediction. So what is our uh, center focuses on? So we uh, acknowledge these problems in deployable AI and we would want to develop fair, ethical and unbiased algorithms for artificial intelligence. And it's often hard to define exactly what is the notion of fairness and so on. And that is one of the research challenges in this uh, particular initiative. And of course, uh, the notion of fairness in, in an Indian context might be completely different from something in the West. And um, the center also hopes to uh, work on this uh, with a, with a uh, <clears throat> trying to come up with an Indian notion of fair source. So this is one uh, particular focus on the center. What is the second focus? Well, um, today's models uh, are so big that you cannot really know what is the model actually trying to predict, right? In the sense that you don't understand why the model is making a particular decision, right? So. Uh, one might ask, why should I care about why the model is making a decision as long as the accuracy of the model is high? Uh, for example, here is a news where a self-driving Uber car actually killed a, a pedestrian in Arizona. And you, as somebody who is looking at uh, analyzing this model, would really want to know why did this model actually uh, did not apply the brakes at that particular time when a passenger actually crossed, right? And if your model cannot explain, then who would you uh, account, uh, I mean, who would be accountable for this crime? for instance, right? So, uh, so this is a bigger problem. Uh, whereas what we see today is that the Googles and the Facebooks are indeed training 
billions and billions of parameter models with parameters and uh, and and they are developing the state of the art a vision system now there is a clear problem here on the one hand you want high accuracy you pump in as much as, as uh, gpu compute time and so on and then make the model highly accurate but then at what cost at the cost of explainability right so the second focus of our group is on explainable ai where we want to interpret these black box state of the art deep neural networks you want to understand what does it mean to say a model is explainable right so a model that might be explainable to me may not be really explainable to a uh, to somebody else right so for instance if you want to do explainability in healthcare you want to understand what does explainability even mean in to a doctor and so on right so this is a big uh, problem today in deployable systems and our uh, center hopes to focus on this as well okay so here is the third problem where we again have this uh, happy story you have data model and then you try to apply it to the uh, real world now what happens is that there are a lot of cases where the data that you have is confidential and you don't want to leak any information whatsoever about the data but then there might be some adversary who might potentially try to see the outputs of the model and then try to guess what this data could be for instance if i want to uh, give my healthcare records to a model so that it can predict whether a particular person is uh, is immune to a particular disease then i don't really want my data to be out in the world right so it is a private data for me uh, but whereas if an adversary could just look at the output of the model and somehow reengineer what the data could be then that's a big issue right so especially when you're deploying in the real world now could this even happen can you just look at the model's output and then try to figure out what is in the data it does not seem so true at least in the laboratory setting but then there are several instances of this actually having been shown for instance uh, there was this famous uh, networld uh, anonymization challenge where uh, net sorry netflix uh, anonymization challenge where netflix wanted to put out its data about what what movies people were liking um, and it anonymized the data whereas uh, there were a set of researchers in this case not really as uh, adversarial as this picture shows but these researchers what they did was was they looked at uh, looked at other auxiliary databases to get some information which were available in public domain to reconstruct uh, what the actual data uh, the anonymized uh, data to de-anonymize the data right so now that this becomes a bigger problem and this is also an important focus of our center to develop private and safe ai algorithms when i say uh, private uh, it could mean different notions of privacy there are cryptographic notions of privacy there are statistical notions of privacy like differential privacy and so on um, and now uh, cryptographic notions are good but then uh, they are typically um, extremely computational in computation in intensive right so there is this accuracy versus privacy versus computation trade off and we want to understand this better uh, as part of the center as well okay moving on uh, again we have this um, data model uh, uh, deployable scenario but what might happen is that over time you have developed a great model that worked perfectly well for your data on which it is trained but then over time uh, as the model starts performing in the real world the distribution of data slowly changes and it becomes completely different from the distribution of data on which the, the model was actually trained right so uh, if there are any uh, so so the the actual data which in this case looks like a ball could actually become like a coffee cup uh, the topologists in the uh, audience could please excuse that joke but uh, what i'm trying to say is that the data distribution can completely change and um, we want to be able to develop models which can actually you know transfer the information that it has it has learned in one distribution to a reasonable distribution um, either uh by getting feedback over time and then trying to adapt to it or by some other means right so we want to develop efficient algorithms for dealing with data drift and this is a very very common problem in real deployable uh, scenario and one has to deal with this uh, and finally uh what we also are in interested in is you have data and then you train a billion parameter model and you want to apply it to the real world but in this case the real world is not so big it's it's in the in your pockets it's in mobile phone which does not have too much compute it cannot store a uh, potentially a huge model it cannot store possibly billion parameters let's say now how can we develop models which will still work well uh, when you have constraints with respect to resources computation and so on right so this is what we'll call as the a for edge 
uh, where we wanted we want to incorporate large scale artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms into edge devices and that comes with its own challenges right so basically we want to understand again trade offs uh, with respect to computation bandwidth latency energy consumption for instance and so on right um, so at a high level so let me now uh, say that the mission of this initiative the center for deployable ai we want to be recognized internationally as a key center for excellence in AI. Um, and we also want to develop algorithms with a focus for, on challenges which are specific to an Indian context, be it in a social challenge, be it uh, A for edge, where not so many people in the country have uh, high-end smartphones. So we still have an Indian version of all the problems that I already mentioned, and we all, we want to focus on them as well. Right. So to, to kind of give an overview of the uh, high level challenges, we have the social challenges, the data challenges, organizational challenges, trust challenges, and system level challenges, which is what I have translated into the different types of focus areas, which are uh, fairness, explainability, transferability, privacy, and A for H. Uh, so we have uh, several current projects running uh, in, this, uh, in, in some of these areas, and we hope to develop other projects uh, in the near future, and you have a glimpse of some of these projects um, in fair in fair AI, explainable AI, and so on. Um, and as center, our goal is to uh, you know have focused research projects, which is obviously an important goal. But not just that, we also want to conduct a lot of international events, uh, conferences, and so on. We want to collaborate with industry partners, um, and we want to you know develop this area of deployable AI um, in the country. Uh, we also want to internationalize, which means that we want to have focused projects with international collaborators. We want to bring visitors to the center and publish in high visibility areas and so on. Um, we have started this already. So in last June, we had this first conference on deployable AI, which was very well attended uh, from people across the country. And we had a great panel of uh, uh, I mean speakers, invited speakers and uh, keynote speakers. Uh, and we also have a couple of boot camps and winter schools coming up. So for the, the students in the audience, um, do consider um, following the web page for information about the boot camps and the winter schools. Uh, and I should say that uh, the sources of support for this uh, project, of course, is um, IATM and MHRD. Other than that, uh, a key part is also by RBCD side, the Robert Bosch Center for Data Science and AI at IATM. Uh, we have an excellent facility with uh, great computational facility and uh, admin staff and so on. Um, and here are the people and most of these, I mean, all of them are in the panel today and you'll be listening to them today as well. Um, and uh, we have some I mean, great set of international collaborators and there's a growing list. We'll have more collaborators in the future. And, and yeah, so with that, I would like to uh, end my brief talk about introducing the Center for Deployable AI and um, I would like to uh, pass it to the moderator. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, <clears throat> uh, first, for a very nice talk that covered so much work in so little time. Very uh, impressive work uh, on high impact problems uh, in, in cutting edge research. Uh, so, thank you for inviting me to moderate this illustrious uh, panel. I'm quite humbled to be here. So. If the panelists are ready, maybe we can just start directly. Uh, and could, could, could the panel motivate a little bit more on why do you think that deployable AI needs an India-specific research? OK, um, maybe I'll start, and then maybe somebody from the panel can take over. Uh, so one of the main reasons is uh, comes in the notion of uh, fairness, um, where the fairness in a in a Western context, typically is with respect to race and gender, which is also important in an Indian context. But then there are several other notions of uh, fairness, right? So right from uh, you know, uh, uh, so there are multiple uh, uh, marginalized communities whom you want to be fair with respect to, and so on. Uh, and the laws in the West might be completely different from the laws in uh, in, in in India with respect to these. Uh, uh, fairness constraints, right? So, and uh, so whenever we say deployable AI, it also means that we are uh, sensitive to the legal aspects of it as well. 
and it that becomes an extremely big challenge when you want to translate the legalities into an abstract mathematical framework and then want to also convince the legal system that we are indeed developing algorithms which are fair with respect to the legal local legal policies and so um, it is it becomes important to understand that in an indian context so that would be my answer but panelists please feel free to add So sure, sure. let me let me chime in. Uh, so uh, because we didn't see our faces when we were introduced, I'm Ravindra. Uh, so and um, um, so there are a lot of issues that are very peculiar to the Indian uh, ecosystem, right? So in fact, even within India, there is no one definition of uh, uh, you know what is fair, and there are actually many legally mandated uh, uh, definitions of fairness within India, which is not necessarily something which we. Uh, AI community has actually uh, bothered itself with. That is one one part of it, right? And the second part is, um, you know, there are many issues in, even in, even in things like privacy, right? So the Indian notions of privacy are very different, right? From from what you would see in a more insular society like the West. Right? So I always jokingly say that when whenever my you know my my mother-in-law goes on a train journey, she'll come back and offer you know puja for somebody else's. You know, but like 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 the delivery to happen, you know, with smoothly and things. I mean, she'll have all kinds of very very fine grained personal information about her co passenger. Yeah, our we our notions of privacy and other things are very different. Right? So we really need to analyze this. Right? We need to ask this question. In fact, one of the problems that we are working on, like one of the current projects that Arun put on the stage, uh, was on trying to understand how introducing AI could potentially, you know, help or worsen the digital divide that exists in India. So this is a question that again has to be asked in the context of the Indian ecosystem. Okay. So what happens when I start putting in AI? Is that a way that I can make sure that you know the digital divide actually comes down in terms of, especially with all this digital India pushed by the government to take more and more people online, right? more and more facilities, more and more government programs online. So what 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 would be the impact? So there are so many very interesting subtle questions that has to be asked in the context of the society or so that, that's something that we want to. I think that those are important, uh, I guess, uh, questions. But but just focusing on fairness for maybe one more minute. <laughs> uh, how do you plan on enabling fairness in India? Like more precisely. So, for instance, let's say if you're talking in 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 the U.S., uh, you, you you have to talk to these sociologists, to the um, social workers, to understand what are the biases that exist in the system, and then work with that. So maybe you, this is a good chance to. Tell us what who are the collaborators outside the technical world um, who are enabling this fair AI? Because I don't think only computer scientists can do this alone. It's actually impossible. And so it would be nice to see what are your outreach efforts um, to to enable this uh, fair AI, fair deployable AI in India. Could you could you talk about it? Yeah, Ravi. Okay, but sorry. Uh, so. Uh, in fact, we are collaborating with the first place we are collaborating with our humanities colleagues here in IIT Madras. So there are people who work in the uh, public policy space, right? There are people who are looking at, uh, you know, both the inequity in society who, who study those, and we are actually working with them. And we have also reached out to a couple of other organizations that look at the impact of policy on, on society, right? For example, there's uh, this tandem research that uh, operates out of Goa. So we have been, uh, we have started engaging with them. Right, and uh, they they are purely policy economics people. They are not technologists, and they also welcome this opportunity to talk to people who understand technology. Right, so these are initial days, but these are the two uh, first uh, steps that we have taken. So one is actually roping in uh, uh, some of our humanities colleagues into this uh, the dialogue. And in fact, the uh, the digital divide project is actually led by one of my uh, humanities colleagues. Right. Okay, so uh, staying on that uh, type, how do you plan on building trust in an AI system? Uh, trust is another important thing uh, nowadays, right? For instance, trust in vaccine seems a challenge everywhere. Um, we had our uh, president last night in a town hall talk about, well, this is not even US if we don't trust science, blah, blah, blah. So how do we, so trust in vaccine seems a challenge. And what I've understood in the last few uh, months is that it's very local. The local explanations are completely different. Why somebody does trust does not trust a vaccine in the U.S. Let's say in in the in the white community is completely different from the African American community because of how uh, things happened in the past thirty years back, right? So 
my question is that in AI, I'm seeing similar behavior. So what are your plans on gaining trust um, among the general population when, when you build these AI systems? So, I mean, I, maybe I can take the initial jab at that step at that. Yeah, so the, uh, so when you say trust, right? So it also uh, somehow connects to the notion of explainability, right? So, uh, so if I want to embrace an AI system, I would want it to, I mean, I want to understand it. So the, so these are two phases of the same coin. So at least in the, in the way of, when we talk about trust with respect to uh, using an AI system, so the as long as the AI system is explainable, it, it knows what it is doing. So and it, and you you can can translate what it is doing into an understandable way. Uh, so that would that could potentially build trust. Uh, of course, one can also come up with uh, the notions of uh, um, you know privacy uh, and so on, where you can guarantee certain things, uh, saying that this is a I mean there is no way that your data could get leaked and so on. Uh, but that's a different notion of uh, trust there, right? So uh, it, trust in using the system versus uh, trust in uh, whether providing my, for instance, my data to the system are two different things. And in one case, it is more, uh, you know, privacy based. And the other case, it is more, I would think, uh, explainability based. So all these are uh, uh, I mean, fit together in the big puzzle. Right, right. But the thing with the privacy, though, is, is goes back to Ravi's point, right? I mean, people get extremely finicky when WhatsApp asks you to sign a contract of service, but they are okay to share the personal details in a, in an, um, in a train journey uh, where they'll tell about when, when they're going to have a second kid and how many weeks they are into it, where is their first kid going to school. So that's that's the, the, the divide, the di divide between their... their Care about the digital information, but on the other hand, when I'm communicating person to person, so there is a more of a trust. That's what I'm trying to point out with a human. They are ready to trust a human and an unknown stranger than an, uh, a well-trained AI system. So I think that that problem is, is I guess, is, is still in the surface as far as. Can I, uh, can I come in there? Uh, so I, I, I think it's not the system itself. See, if you tell something to a stranger, that stranger is not going to take your data and exploit it later. Most likely they're never going to see you again, right? So that's an implicit understanding that is there. Whereas if I go and put in Facebook that I'm going to have my second kid, you can imagine um, the number of advertisements I would be flooded with. So Perfect. we have to really understand the concept of privacy. It's not that we are not private people. I think we sometimes don't bother because it's not going to come back and bite us. And in other cases, in digital media, it's always biting us back. That's a feeling. So somehow we have to think, take that into account. Just another uh, perspective on it. Thank you. Thank you. That, that greatly well, if, helps. If I can also know, come in there, add, add another perspective to that, right? So, I mean, when you're traveling in the train, the kind of uh, you know, people that you interact with, they come from all backgrounds. Right? And then you have people who are using some of the applications, perhaps they come from higher income. Right, using smartphones, they are from higher income, and you know, they are obviously more educated, perhaps. So uh, I think that also has a role to play. Uh, inherently, you know, we say uh, the villagers they trust everybody. Right? The city folk they are less likely to. So maybe that's another perspective to that. So that, that, that which is exactly the point that I was making earlier, right? So we cannot transfer the Western notions directly to India. I think that needs to be a dialogue. In fact, we don't, technologists here don't talk to social scientists usually. Right? I mean, in fact, there is a huge mistrust going both ways, uh, which I found out when I attended a few events at Tandem. <laughs> but, uh, the point is, uh, we, need, we need this dialogue to start. Right? And yeah, there are but... a couple of, I mean, there are two things to the question that you asked, right? There is, there is a system side of things, right? That's something that the technologists can answer directly, that Arun was talking about explainability, you know, privacy, trust, and things like that. But then there's also a social uh, kind of a policy or social engineering side of things where you would, you know, talk about how do you communicate the trust to people? Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know. Maybe the answer is as simple as, you know, getting Rajinikanth to say, I trust AI. I, mean, <laughs> I don't know what the social engineering side of it would be, right? So we really have to think about it. But I, I don't think we have enough, we have done enough in the technology side even to address that. Rajnikanth has already said that, right? Yeah. No. Through his movie, he's already said that. 
Uh, sure. Just one more you know? quick uh, point here. Uh, I, I also think uh, more importantly, we should trust the system. In every example that Arun gave, I don't think the original intent was ever to be biased. And it was just an uh, artifact of multiple things that happened. So I think one of the important things is before you put a system out, you should have these adversarial cases and you should really have a panel of experts who look at the results and then play around with it enough so that you are convinced that um, it is likely to be unbiased uh, as much as possible. I think that is another view that I think all of us should take uh, before any of these systems are deployed. And particularly in an Indian context where I think if you had an algorithm which was doing lots of things, a lot of people who are not even literate about what's happening, the ability to question itself is less than a Western society. So we have to be particularly more careful in an Indian context is what I think. I think great points. I think no, uh, uh, just I mean, one maybe, one yeah. thing to quickly, you know, just add there, right? To kind of corroborate what Professor Raghu was saying and also Professor Ravi was saying. See, even the response is different, right? Even in a system that is, let's say, not fair or not trustworthy. So take something like loan disbursement, right? Um, we've seen systems where if it is not robust enough and it's slightly predictable, the response is a lot of gamification in the Indian public, at least in the microfinance sector. So they're like, oh, if I lie this way and I put in this thing, then I'm more likely to get a better loan. So what would have normally been as outrage in one place is not being seen as much as outrage out here. And it's just seen as an opportunity to, hey, I can game the system. You know, I'm going to send my wife instead of myself, and I'm actually going to uh, ask for X amount in, and I'm going to lie about my income. So even the nuances of what adoption means and what human response is and what the long-term implications are is also a little different, even though in both systems it's not fair or in both systems it's not trustworthy. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think these are excellent perspectives to get. And, and I think, I mean, when we have so much perspectives, talking to um, social scientists and humanities will, will definitely only increase our knowledge of what needs to be done. Uh, locally, I think that's more important. So may, there is a there are like seventy five questions right now in the uh, audience panel. So before I go through that, I wanted to just hit on two important questions. So A is um, uh, well, what what sectors? Just a quick poll. What sectors do you think AI is going to have the highest impact in India? Uh, this is only in India, so let's not talk about the other countries. In India, what do you think would be the uh, sectors? So maybe one or two from each of you, quickly. Um, I could go with my own bias and say it would be healthcare, right? There's a lot of opportunity there and it's just, um, I think it's uh, quite clearly we are understaffed in, in terms of healthcare. We do not have enough radiologists, we do not have enough doctors. So if we could speed up some of the processes by sort of AI guided, right? So AI guided radiologist who makes far fewer mistakes and looks at far, far more x-rays per day than a normal radiologist, that might have a huge impact. And um, we have already been uh, working on some of these things as uh, if people would, uh, you know, I, I know this question answer session is going great, but we have the next webinar starting in a few minutes where uh, Himanshu is gonna be talking about uh, some of these aspects of actually building an India specific model for uh, dating pregnancies and things like that. So these are really crucial India specific problems that nobody else works on and uh, doesn't matter much to other people. And I think we have a huge scope for impact there because uh, I mean, um, I mean it's, it's quite obvious, like healthcare is, uh, uh, especially during the pandemic, I think we've all realized the value and importance of healthcare. I would also add in a similar way in literacy, right? With vernacular teaching and so on and um, uh, making material accessible things like that. I think that's an area if AI can have an impact in India, given our demographic demographic dividend, I think it would be an incredible thing for AI to do if that is indeed possible. Yeah, I agree. A in education, I mean, uh, would would have great impact. Uh, and, and there are so many avenues there to do really good work, I think. Yeah. Um, I would go with governance. You know, we have a huge population and uh, understaffed government departments. So if the government has to you know, deal with all the population of all the sectors that you have, right, they will need uh, AI solutions to deliver. 
I think there's a very interesting question in the uh, chat box which says, is, can AI be used by the judiciary for speeding up judgment, right? That uh, ties into the governance part that Geeta is mentioning. Yeah. So I, I'm actually going to take a slightly different back to what Karthik said, not just healthcare, but, but public health. That, that's slightly different, right? Especially when you're talking about things like the pandemic and stuff like that. It is not just the treatment of the pandemic, but also figuring out you know, how we are going to manage it. And, and that's a place where AI can have a significant impact and it will have a significant impact. Okay, so now I'm going off questions uh, from the uh, audience because we have like eight minutes. And I think these are in, important areas to cover and the audience have a bunch of areas as well uh, that they are asking. So the first question that I thought was interesting, maybe you can uh, explain a little bit about how can professionals get involved with your efforts? They, so the question is how can, I'm, I'm a working software engineer, I'm working, you know, the, I'm working professional, how can I get involved with your efforts? So could, could any of you chime in? Yeah, so uh, let me give you an example, right? So uh, I work with some uh, finance fintech uh, related companies uh, where uh, we are trying to understand what is their notion of fairness, right? So uh, for instance, uh, they want to approve or uh, not approve loans for people. Uh, so there might be a certain notion of fairness, but then the question is, uh, what is their legal policy within the system? And uh, what are the constraints within which they are operating? And now uh, there has to be a dialogue here with, between the academic the academic folks and the industry so that we can, you know, at least agree on what is the problem uh, that we want to solve, right? So, and this differs from company to company. So, unless we have an interaction on a case-by-case -case basis, we will not even be able to like, uh, zoom into a single problem. Uh, and, and I'm sure all the panelists will have uh, some, some experience with some uh, industry uh, partners where they have these questions come up, yeah. The simplest answer is uh, RBC Desai has a website, come look at what we are doing, write to us, and then directly start interacting. I think we are a very open bunch of people who are looking at solving real problems. So anyone in the audience who is really interested in engaging with us, all they need to do is send an email. Right. So just, in, just, in particular, we have the yeah. Associate Researcher Program, right? Uh, that's something that I would encourage you to look at. Ravi, sorry. No, I was just going to say that there are a lot of uh, avenues by which, which we, we, people can work with us. It's not just the one program that Gita mentioned. So we don't want to consume the time listing all of it, but do take a look at the, the page. And I would also encourage working professionals who want to you know, get into AI, right? Look at the diploma option that the online BSc program at IIT Madras offers. So the online BSc program is not just for the school graduates, it's even for working professionals. If they want to earn a one-year diploma, I would strongly encourage you to look at that. And even through that one-year diploma, we have multiple other news with which you can collaborate with the center. So do, do take a look at that. Okay, and, and I'm summarizing several questions in one, so it's kind of a, a loaded question. Um, AI uh, is, it seems to be everywhere, but there is also the fear about an unemployment due to AI. Um, there's positive people thinking, you know, the gap between skilled and unskilled workers might reduce. The other extreme is saying that, you know, what if many unskilled labor just goes out uh, with AI and robotics to the fold? Uh, what do you guys as illustrious panelists uh, have as, uh, you know, answer to, to uh, allay these fears about AI just taking over uh, the jobs? This is a question that comes up uh, every time a new technology that seems like it's going to disrupt the market uh, happens. Um, of course, it's a well-known fact till now, every time uh, technology has come in, which looks like it's going to disrupt it, it has only increased employment. But you know that's that's not saying a it will not have a different impact or a, a different kind of uh, impact on this employability. So at least prior data does not suggest that new technology will make people unemployable or employability issues. But there is no crystal ball for this. I think uh, I don't see anything dramatically changing at least in the next decade. If I were to stick my head out and say that. But after that, predict, as someone said, uh, uh, predictions are hard, particularly about the future. So I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's to be seen, is what I would say. 
So, I mean, in fact, I, I had this nice slide where we show multiple studies and there are more studies that show that AI is going to create new kinds of jobs rather than studies I mean, that show that there's so many, so much jobs would get lost due to AI, right? And so what's going to happen is, yes, there will be job displacement. Right? I, we, we, any, any, any new technology, any disruptive technology as pervasive as AI is certainly going to create job displacement. So you might have to move jobs. You might have to retrain yourself. There will be some, some amount of effect on the society. But just to say that 70% of the people will be jobless or out of, out of the market, it's just like, like Raghu said, not supported by history. Right? So when, for example, it goes all the way back, at least when the steam engine was uh, introduced, I guess people said, oh, that's the devil's work because it's going to make so many people lose right? back then. Okay? Uh, so now similar kind of uh, conspiracy theories about AI and uh, so it just doesn't hold water. Yeah. No, and, and, and you know, another uh, take at this is, sure, there might be job displacement and sure, we don't know the consequences on wealth inequality as well as a result of this, but what are your options? So I think this is a very important question and should be looked at very carefully, but the option can't be no AI or anti-AI, right? So this kind of question sometimes comes with a very polarizing tone to it. And the thing is, of course, it's a very important topic, but therefore, how do we move with AI advancement and address this issue rather than saying AI is the straw man that I'm going to beat up right now. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I, 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 when this question is asked to me, my answer would be that imagine how it would be if all of us have three day weekends. Maybe that, that is where we will get at some point as an optimist in me tells me that you know people working in banks speaking people working in other sectors would get three day three day weekends that would be pretty awesome um, so I, I think the last question is is many of them and and again several of them has asked what is deployable ai right so going circling back to the most uh, central thing could could you give give an example of one deployable ai system that that if you have done maybe the concrete example might help so i think i covered a couple of examples in my slides, right? So deployable AI is uh, thinking about problems and challenges that arise when you want to take an AI system and then apply it to the real world, right? So a concrete example could be just using an AI system to decide if you want to uh, give a loan or not to somebody who's applying for a loan in a bank, right? It's as simple as that. And now you have a system, but you want to think about several aspects uh, surrounding the problem, not just the accuracy of the system, but then there are several other issues um, which arise when you want to take the system and apply it in the real world. And the deployable AI initiative is to try to understand the surrounding problems uh, and try to come up with uh, ways to um, solve those problems um, algorithmically. Right? So that would be the short answer. Yeah. I mean, any one of our co-panelists can pick multiple instances that they've actually Right. solutions that are deployed. So maybe Raghu, you want to take a stab? Or? Yeah, so we have uh, developed a system which is a digital twin uh, for an aluminum smelter, uh, which can basically mimic how an aluminum smelter is working. So there are lots of AI components in that. So like Ravi said, every one of us have been working on this and we have been interfacing with industry. So we can give a laundry list of things that can be done. Uh, but I, I, I think uh, the time is the fact right here, I guess. Yeah, that's why I kind of circled it as the last one. Uh, so thank you so much. I think we are exactly at 8.45. So thank you so much uh, for enlightening us all with specific issues in India and AI. I'm, I'm, there are 165 questions that are still open, but I kind of summarize some of them in, in a group. So if you get a chance, maybe go and, and answer. Yeah, them. so I can, I, I mean, so uh, if any of the panelists want to stay back and answer some of the questions, uh, we still have this uh, link open. I have to drop off and join the other IBSC panel and Shidam, if you would like to be. Thank you for moderating the panel. It's like really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank panel. you. It was really enlightening. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sridham. Thank you. Sridham. Thank you. Sridham. Thank you. Arun, do you want to take any interesting questions from the Q&A panel and keep going for some more time? Sure, I'm just trying to look at the questions. Uh, if anybody else finds some question interesting, please uh, feel free to pick that.
So you know, that is one question on, you know, should you give AI uh, to do crucial tasks like working in the medical field where a real person should be doing it, keeping in mind that can be malfunctioning and errors in AI. Would that be an ideal thing? It's taking human lives? That's a question that I thought was interesting. So one, uh, just uh, take on that question, right? And please uh, chime in. Is there are two ways to answer the question, right? One is to see if uh, the AI system has does better than the human who's currently doing it. So there's one benchmark that's already set up, right? If either it's autonomous driving or whether it's uh, medical practice, um, right now there is some failure rate which we call as human error. And the question can always be, hey, when you ask this hard question, should we stake human lives? Um, then is the system going to be better and that's one way to kind of answer the question. But of course, this leads to another question also. I mean, another challenge to answering it so simply, which is a utilitarian perspective, um, which is to kind of say culpability. Now, at least when a doctor makes a mistake, I know I can kind of say it's the doctor to blame. Or if a driver does something wrong and crashes into my car, I know it's the driver's fault. But when an AI system does it, where do you assign blame? And so is it sufficient for me to just say, is it the algorithm that did the fault or is it the driver who is in charge of the algorithm or is it the person who implemented the code? So it, it leads to more complicated uh, you know, questions. And, and so I don't think the answer is as simple as only saying that, well, as long as I can beat the human being, that's enough for me to say that I would trust the AI to go ahead, um, right? Uh, So I think there was a question about uh, how do you remove the bias in the data? Uh, it was kind of interesting in the sense that you already have the data and uh, you cannot really remove the bias in the data per se, but then you can uh, develop algorithms which are um, which try to you know uh, be bias free. I mean, the data is there, right? So you cannot re really change the data, but then you can. In fact, develop algorithms which take into account that it might be biased with respect to a particular, you know, um, gender, particular race, and things like that, and then try to develop um, bias-free algorithms. Now, the problem there is how do you develop that? Um, what do you lose by doing that? You might lose some accuracy. So now that is where the uh, trade-off comes between accuracy and bias, and which is where the the effort on research effort uh, is on developing uh, unbiased. Uh, AI um, so there is a question on how can a help in local governance uh, that is municipal corporations and waste disposal uh, right some small funded corporations right? so interestingly you know that uh, several smart cities in India have actually set up cameras just above your uh, you know, trash bins your uh, garbage bins to identify when the garbage bin fills up. And then that information is relayed to the, uh, the truck operator so that they can come and clear the garbage bin as soon as it's filled, right? So that's an example of you know, uh, an AI system that's been deployed in the field where it's helping you know, local governments handle the situation. Yeah. I think a wish list there would be to whenever somebody fills garbage, the system should automatically detect whether they are you know, segregating waste, right? So dry uh, and wet waste, which almost never happens in our country, but it makes uh, waste uh, waste management much easier, right? So and for instance, one could hopefully come up with a system which says, which kind of, let's say, it rings an alarm bell saying that, hey, you have not, you're not using the dry waste bin for the wet waste bin and so on, for instance. Mm -hmm. I think it's difficult to scroll. There's so many questions. <laughs> so uh, there's a question about where do I find data? If I want to do something in AI, then where can I get the data? All right, the data requirement is huge. Uh, 
so I think yesterday we had a very interesting talk on uh, data commons uh, by uh, uh, Guha from Google, Dr. Guha. So uh, if you, you know, look for that video online, uh, you should be able to find it. And you know, that has some information about uh, public sources of data. Okay, so I think uh, should we end here? Uh, sure, I think uh, uh, we can probably end, but uh, I just want to point out that uh, if you want to know about the recent projects and uh, get more information about uh, the, the initiatives of the center itself, please visit the um, RBCDSI webpage. And if you're a student looking to somehow uh, collaborate uh, and get involved more in AI, so there are several opportunities if you're a researcher, yes, and so on. Uh, so please do take a look at the website. It's rbcdsi.iitm.ac.in. Um, maybe with that, uh, we can probably close the session if that's fine.